Thank you very much, Ashok. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the questions of how you would go about customizing large bodies of material. Uh, and it's a pleasure to come out here in California. It's like visiting America uh, when you come from New England. Uh, and I remember visiting Xerox Park over 20 years ago and seeing the first color digital image I'd ever seen uh, and seeing it projected. And that was the moment when this, the work that we're starting, that I'm talking about now, began. Because the fundamental question is what happens when absolutely everything can be represented in a digital form? And what are the impacts upon intellectual life? Uh, and those impacts, those effects are only just now starting to be felt. So obviously thanks to all the nice people who have supported us. Uh, especially since this is a public talk. Uh, and I want to start by answering a question that has been posed to me, which is what, is the grand, what are the grand challenges uh, in the humanities as opposed to other disciplines? And I would say that there is really one big challenge, uh, and it's a pretty general one, and that is how do we understand human expression? Uh, and that are really three layers that I would look at this question in, and the first is just general systems of expression. Now, systems of expression can be visual. Uh, they don't have to be linguistic. I'll talk about textual systems of expression and especially digitized textual materials. But I want to emphasize that this general principle extends beyond that. Uh, and so you have the system of expression can be very simple and factual. And then the question may be, how would you understand expressed in one language, say Arabic, the directions from point A to point B? Uh, that may be a, a translation which you can perfectly capture because there's a very well-defined task, a well-defined set of, of actions being described. Uh, but when, as you move into different cultures, you have more complex interactions. You may be dealing with concepts of honor or of, of kinship uh, that do not translate from one culture to another. Uh, and then, of course, there's another layer of individual style. Uh, and the humanist generally tends to, as, as humanists have often focused historically on outstanding elements of style, what separates Beethoven or Dickens uh, or, or Plato from the people around them. But most of what I do is try to think about how one would go about addressing these issues at scale. How would you under, be able to understand better human expression when you have lots and lots of it online, and especially across cultures and languages? So there are two sub-questions I'll look at. The first is, what might dig, true digital documents look like uh, if you go past this sort of first generation of digital materials, and this first generation is really retrospective, as is often the case with new media. It's imitating the past. Uh, and then the second question is, if we have a model in our minds, or to come up with a model for what we think an ideal environment would look like, uh, how do we get all the legacy data that we have uh, that, you, that this organization, Google, is doing more than anyone else to put online, how do we make that actually useful for new purposes. So I'm going to talk about incunabula. And uh, for those of you out there uh, who actually know anything about early books, I apologize for my, my oversimplified description of what incunabula are. But I use this term to describe the first generation of printed books and this period of uh, experimentation when no one really knew what a printed book would look like. Uh, and when the first books came out, they were imitating manuscripts. And then manuscripts imitated books. And there was a generation or so before you had tables of contents, page numbers, and the, the layout that you take for granted now when you work with information. Uh, and the point to emphasize is that is a, a process that takes a while to, take, to, to, to run. Uh, and I give an example here of a page from a Gutenberg Bible uh, where, of course, what was printed was, the I believe, the black print. I'm not sure if the red was printed or not. But none of the illumination, none of the pictures, the illustrations around the edges were done mechanically. Uh, you have the mechanical print in the center, but then someone painted by hand all the pretty pictures around there. Uh, and the real question right now is to what extent in what we're doing, what is the movable print and what is the illumination? Uh, and I emphasize that people don't sit around talking about the evils of illuminated manuscripts. Uh, they're rather attractive. But you could not have modern society if you were illuminating every, man, every page of every copy of every scientific publication. Uh, you needed to leave that behind so that we could all live more than 30 years uh, and travel across the country in less than two years. So what might digital post-incunabular 
digital libraries look like, uh, well, they're not going to look like PDF files. And I think PDF files are going to be the classic instance of the incunabulum of a digital age, because they are successful because they look like the past. And they add some marginal utility to the past. They're searchable. I have a whole pile of PDFs on my laptop. Uh, and in fact, I won't collect paper anymore for serious work. Uh, if I, I really emphasize work I can do in a wholly digital form. But nevertheless, most of the objects are PDFs. Okay? There are four dimensions, in my mind, that define at least uh, the uh, space of truly digital documents that are separate from the dimensions of print. There may be more things out there, but I think these are four minimal criteria that you would need to meet. Uh, and I'll talk about each of them uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, separation of data from presentation, recombinant data, dynamic data, and books that talk to one another in, in homage to uh, Marvin Minsky. So separation of content and presentation is probably the most trivial of them all. It's like saying you should all eat lots of vegetables and not drink too much and get lots of exercise. I don't eat enough vegetables, uh, but I know it's a good thing and it doesn't hurt to be reminded of it. So this is an example of a complex chunk of text. It's a dictionary entry as we represent it in our digital library. Uh, and it's wonderful, of course. We will spend a lot of time thinking about how to represent it. The underlying data is, of course, substantially more complicated, and that's a heavily marked up piece of XML uh, that was worked on, took shape really about 10 years ago. Uh, but the key is that if we just make it available in HTML, then that's what you get. But if you make this available, and we do by a service for every addressable chunk of text in our digital library, then other people can build clever new services and I just give the trivial example, uh, not actually not such a trivial example, just an example of another person who took this dictionary, changed the layout on the left-hand side using colors to communicate semantic information in what I think is a pretty effective way. But more significantly, that person built a service on the right-hand side that links etymologically related words based on the information within the lexicon that that person was able to mine directly. That's a service I can tell you is useful and I, at some point, I'll get around to building it ourselves, maybe when I'm 125. Uh, but obviously, by making the content available in a fashion that other people can build on at a deep level, uh, then you enable other creativity to come in and do things that your group can't do. And I'm quite conscious that my research group is a bottleneck right now, uh, where there's just not enough of us. So we have to roll things out and let more people work on it. Now, recombinant data is a little more interesting uh, and that's the, the idea that you want to be able to disassemble your, your documents into pieces uh, and that machines need to be able to reassemble things on the fly. I'll give you an example, again, that doesn't look like much, but it's actually kind of interesting uh, from my perspective. And this is a chunk of text. Uh, it looks like a lot of other chunk, chunks of text in the world, but in fact, it's not just a chunk of text. This is a library catalog and object viewer rolled into one. One of the problems we have is that our library infrastructure is wonderful. It's actually, um, the catalogs are kind of an amazing thing, uh, but they do not have the granularity uh, that we need. And in fact, this would be a thing to think about in Google Books, where the focus is on the book. Nobody reads books. I'm not interested in a book. I want a couple of pages or paragraphs or a chunk, a logically useful chunk. I don't have time to read a book unless someone asks me to review it. I don't know anybody reads books unless they're on an airplane. Uh, or they have some exceptional purpose. Most of the work that people do is based on finding logical chunks, the right article from a journal, the right paragraph, the right table, whatever. So absolutely, there's nothing else that I emphasize. The book is the, not the level of, of the unit of, of functionality, uh, in my view. Certainly in my life and the life of everybody I teach and everybody I work with, maybe there's somebody else for whom books per se are interesting. Now in this case, what we've done is we've gotten asked for a display of information, not only about a work, but about a subset of a work. In this case, classicists were really smart. Uh, I have to say, my, my colleagues 150 years ago did something really clever. They agreed upon, for most authors, a coordinate system, essentially, whereby they could describe chunks of text. So Thuc 1.86 uh, could be spelled differently. There are variants of expressing that concept. 
but it has described the same basic chunk of information for and, more than 150 years. I'm not, I'm not even sure when we picked up, when, who started this, but for a long time, which means you can assemble inf and aggregate and, and, and fuse data from many different sources. If you're able to parse the, the mappings within the, do the documents that you're digitizing. So you, the pages don't matter, it's the chapters and the citation scheme within. Uh, and in this case, what you have is a report, and it shows not just one translation, but multiple translations of the same object, various people who have added notes to this canonical text, because people will talk about important texts and store their annotations. Uh, information that's been extracted automatically uh, and it could be combined with other sources of, of annotation. Uh, references pointing into this so you can find dictionaries and grammars that talk about this particular passage. You know, it's all very commonplace stuff, but it works because you have a common identifier to describe the work and then the chunks within the work and the chunks within the work that are small enough to be useful. Uh, and with this, of course, you can drive once you have translation in Greek, for example, side by side, you can start doing parallel text analysis. There's another layer, actually, of granularity within the, the canonical structure that would break this down even more finely. But even if you have chapter to chapter, you can do auto automatic alignment and get about 75% uh, of, of the sentences lined up side by side. And if you have enough sentences, you'll do clever things. So dynamic data, I mean, again, this is no news, but it's not how humanists tend to think. Uh, and that's where the data itself changes, you know, your reference works that grow over time. Uh, and this is one thing that humanists who have a tendency to, to, to get really excited about their own expression need to rethink uh, because we need reference works that can evolve in real time. As, and if it's, to some extent, the smaller the discipline, the more important it is that we have uh, community-driven resources because we can't spend millions of dollars paying people to do our work for us. And the, clearly, the, the historic example of this is Google, is Wikipedia. Uh, and here's an article on uh, an aspect of Athenian democracy from Wikipedia from March 2006. And it's pretty serviceable. Classicists uh, can look at this, though, and make fun of it because the Greek, uh, which you, I don't have a pointer for, but there's Greek up there, which does not have accents, which it should. And in fact, there's an error because a form is, is said to be plural when, in fact, it's genitive. So you can say, well, how nothing can be right here because they got the Greek wrong. Uh, and then six months later, of course, in this self-organizing system, I just happened to discover when I did my presentation that people had come in and, of course, had fixed the problems and added structure. Uh, and so the grand, a grand challenge for humanists, uh, certainly, is to figure out how to work with this new current of energy rather than against it or to dismiss it. And to dismiss it is the usual course among academics. And how do we get there? This is an example of the first tenure book I know of that was entirely electronic, and it's on Athenian democracy. It is the source for Athenian democracy, and if you Google right now Athenian democracy, I think you'll see uh, Chris Blackwell's Demos show up right next to Wikipedia. But here is a, this is an article or a book that was written to be part of a digital library where the citation, the, the habits of citation are fundamentally different. He has links to the primary evidence for every proposition that he can think of. The idea is that everything is supposed to be transparent. This actually addresses the problem of Wikipedia. The problem with Wikipedia isn't that it's innovative. The problem of Wikipedia is that it's conservative. It's imitating the Encyclopedia Britannica, which, made, which reflects a tradition of leaving out information because of print, or because you think people are stupid, or they don't care. Uh, and that is actually, a problem. That's, to me, the problem with most reference works. And so here, you know, my colleague has put all the citations in. It's all in XML, so we can filter them out if you don't want to read them. But what you want, and what he's interested in, and other people could be, is you might start with this as an initial state, where everything has been added, added with, with some kind of uh, evidence, and then open this up and let it flow and evolve on its own as a wiki, or whatever medium you want. But I would say that if in 100 years or 1,000 years, when people look back to the opening of the 21st century, I do think Wikipedia will be thought of as the most important intellectual development, not necessarily because of its content, but because it represents the first different mode of intellectual production that I can think of in several hundred years. And because I thought it was impossible and was ridiculous, it would never work, and it has. So uh, I, I like things which remind me of how stupid I am 
or how limited, you know, how hard it is to predict the future. And the last feature uh, that I think distinguishes minimally true digital documents is that they talk to each other. They react with each other, interact with each other in real time to serve people's needs. Uh, and I give this as an example uh, that we've been using for 10 years. And I, I published something about a year ago where I thought I would use this phrase, and I said, no, I've been using this phrase on and off since 1993. Uh, and it's an allusion to Marvin Minsky, uh, who said something along the lines of, people, the time would come when no one would believe that the books in the library had not always talked to one another. Uh, and I think Marvin Minsky was thinking about Plato and Descartes having a serious philosophical conversation or Dickens revising you know, his own uh, novels and so on. Uh, but I think, and that hasn't happened and may not happen anytime soon, but the idea works already in a very trivial way. And the triviality of the technology is what makes this significant. And so what you've got here is a Greek text. Someone's reading the Greek text and they've had a question about what a word means. Uh, and they've clicked on the word. And what happens is the Greek text is then saying, oh, I have a question about this word in this line. It goes to a database of, of language, which is equivalent to what used to be a printed book called Tutti e Verbi Greci. Uh, and then the database of language says, this word is this form. And then the user says, well, what does it mean? And a dictionary gets called up. So there are three different books pulled off the shelf, as it were, in the analog to the print world. But what's different is that the books all know about each other. And when you get to the dictionary, the dictionary has asked the, the text, well, who are you? And what is this person reading? And the text has said, I'm Aeschylus Agamemnon, a play called Agamemnon. And the user has asked a question about line nine. Uh, and so the dictionary says, OK, what do I know about Aeschylus? And goes through and, and highlights all its Aeschylus citations. And in fact, realizes, aha, I actually have a comment about what this word means in this line of the Agamemnon. And adapts itself on the fly using some highlighting and, and, and setting itself up or you know, scrolling into this larger document. Now, nothing has changed. No, none of the content has been modified. Uh, we have the, the, the style sheet has changed a little bit. But in fact, the value of the information in this, in this reference work has been enhanced because it's easier to find. The cost of getting it is lower. Uh, and the books essentially, if three books have had a conversation among themselves, conspiring to make the life of the user more or simpler uh, and to bring that information more quickly. That is the principle, that the books, in fact, have these conversations among themselves uh, dynamically every time the user does anything. That is, a, to me, the most important fundamental principle of what I would imagine a digital library to be. So you've got this hybrid library now. Uh, and in the old days, it was sort of, you know, the arrow of time ran forward inevitably and, and, and in a heavy-handed fashion. Authors produce content, libraries collect books and so on, uh, and then readers sit around and read the books. Now everybody interacts in real time. Uh, and you're, you know, everything can change, uh, and there's much less fixity in the system. Uh, essentially, your user performs an action uh, and every time anybody does anything, you, should, you probably already are. In this organization, you're mining it to see what you can learn. The question is, how much more semantic depth can you get out of what you're mining? How much structure can you know about what this person is doing? Uh, and then, you know, the system gets smarter. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the automatic processes uh, that I would think of as essential. And in fact, there's lots of, of services, and these are just some of them. One to me that is everybody seems to need in the sciences and in the humanities is named entity analysis. And I spent years uh, building a system in part for pedagogical purposes so I would understand how the problem worked uh, and in part to deliver some services to, to deal with the named entity identification of American English, which is actually a hard problem because of the ambiguity of American English, which is worse than European and worse uh, than ancient languages. And so essentially, your digital library needs to be mining its own resources. You need to be able to read your own encyclopedias, your own gazetteers, uh, to make yourself smarter so that you know, you know who, the who are people, and you know that how often Washington is a person versus a place in a given context. And in, and in 1855, you know which Washingtons exist 
uh, if you're trying to identify, you know semantically it's a place and you want to figure out which place it is. Uh, this is just an example of you know, that process done to some text at scale, nothing new to you guys. Uh, but this is, uh, all, the, all the markup there is of course automatic, except for I think some of the structural markup. But then you can start building services. Now this is something that looks a lot like what you have for Google Books that was released at the end of January, where you have a thing, you go to the About Books, what places are in the book, and you get a map, which I think is a really cool service in part because we've been thinking about the problem for a long time. This is similar to what's been done, but it illustrates a couple things that are needed uh, to make it really useful. First of all, this is a smaller chunk of text. This is a set of, of uh, places in a chapter. Okay, so again, that's not that big a deal, but you've got to think about it. And these are the places referenced in a chapter uh, of a Civil War history. And of course, uh, you know, the results are pretty good. There are errors in here. Uh, up here at the top, that's, I think there's like a Muddy Creek or some ambiguous place name that gets placed in Rhode Island because there are too many of them. But the basic geographic focus of this chunk of document is uh, captured pretty well. Uh, and this is something I'm sure you could do. The trick is, how do you make this work well, optimize this for different domains? Because the places referred to in the 19th century, in 19th century English, are really different from those that would pop out if you use the Getty at the source of geographic names or a modern gazetteer. And as you move away from the focus of the modern world, your results are going to get worse. And what people often want are the 5 or 10% that you don't get. They want the places whose names have changed. They want the things, the high value services depend upon knowledge of domain specific functions. Okay, lexical analysis, language tools, I just skip over that, I just say it's nice to be able to understand what things mean. Now I wanna talk about user interactions where the rubber really hits the road. And there are three things that I think we need in the humanities, and I think a lot of people need them, but I know we need them in the humanities uh, across the board. Uh, and I would say that's where readers talk and books listen, and then customization and personalization. Uh, and the, when I talk about readers talking and books learn or listening, uh, if you have a system with many, many services, all of which are automatic, doing their clever best to try to identify one thing or another, they're deciding it's a person or a place, and if it's a place, which Washington is it, there's always an error rate. And people are really good uh, much better at classifying and clustering often than machines. We did a study of what we call disambiguating links in Wikipedia. How often do people connect Springfield to the right Springfield? And basically, they're always right. I mean, 99 point some percent. I mean, it's, it's great. So people, uh, you may argue about the content of a Wikipedia article, but the implicit links within the, which is, and each link is a propositional statement saying, this string at this place is this entity. Uh, those are very useful. Uh, so there's a lot of classes of that. Here's an instance of a um, complicated, well, of, of Latin morphology. Here's a word, what are its possible forms? There's a bunch of possibilities because it's highly ambiguous. And the numbers, the simple Bayesian statistics or whatever machine learning we're using, it's hard to pick out the right one. Uh, what do you think? And we were lazy and didn't have time. We didn't give people accounts. We just let people, the world vote. Uh, and the results are any one vote is about 80% accurate, but as you get more and more votes, and that system itself is 70% accurate, uh, comes up with the top answer 70% of the time. Uh, and, but as your votes, as you get more votes, they converge on the right answer. Uh, and so even if any one vote is not very useful uh, or is problematic and has an error rate, you know, they, they quickly converge. And if you have a divergence, you cluster into two different chunks of votes, you actually probably have something significant. You probably have ambiguity, and that by itself is data. But how do you make it possible? What are the mechanisms whereby you accumulate propositional information? Because essentially what someone has done is said, you know, generate a piece of RDF or triplet saying this thing at this place is this class. And it could be person, place, it could be syntax, in syntax it could be any classification job that you want to think of. How do you make this possible for the classification jobs of a given discipline, whether it's chemical compounds uh, or genealogy where you're trying to figure out which Smith is which. Uh, a customization, that's obviously where the, as I understand it, where people decide, say, I want to see things about the Red Sox, or I make a decision how the information will be, will be 
filtered to me. And so this is an instance of analysis of words in a chunk of Latin, uh, 300 running words, 221 unique words. Uh, and so we've done an analysis by filtering out inflections. And there's a lot of, it's actually a fair amount of work in this. And so this is a summary of what's involved in a chunk of text. You could have other features of interest in a, in a document. Uh, but this is what we really want. In this case, what we've done is we've provided the system with a profile that describes what elements of this language, it happens to be Latin, it could be Arabic, it could be technical terms uh, in a scientific document. Which of these words, which of these symbols has the user encountered in the past? And then I want to have separate the ones that are clearly new from the ones that, are, that have been encountered in the past and then rank the ones that are new. Uh, so that you, and you can rank them according to different criteria. You can do a TF-IDF kind of thing. Or you can, if you're more clever, you might know this user is interested in uh, the history of law. And so legal terms would be emphasized more than other terms would be. But you want to be able to customize that. But the idea is to, to, to filter, to analyze the search space for every individual, or the, the, the analysis space for every individual and, and provide a, pro, a sort of customized briefing form reflecting their own background and their own knowledge, and then be able to say, well, you learned this 10 years ago in this class, or you encountered this word in these contexts to give people access to their own background more effectively. That's a pretty general issue, and it reflects the need for a kind of, well, the interest in a kind of, of uh, learning medical profile that you might develop over time that would allow you to control the things that you've encountered and thus maximize your background. Again, that's not rocket science uh, in the simple case, but it's very powerful. Uh, and we'll be doing this with Arabic uh, this fall, uh, where we'll be modeling what people know as they go into intermediate Arabic. And when they're reading Al Jazeera, which of the terms they see are the ones they've seen in the past and so on. And I, I'm actually trying to follow along with the Arabic students myself and I'm rather psyched at this. Now, personalization is, of course, where the system, uh, rather than the user, uh, takes action on its own. And everybody, uh, even classicists, all have had the experience of seeing people who bought this book also bought the other books and giving way to temptation and buying more stuff than they plan to buy. So recommender system. But we, you, know, you can apply this sort of thing to a learning context as well. Uh, we discovered when a guy named Dee Scully, who's a student of Carla Broadley, uh, one of my colleagues in computer science, looked at user logs and analyzed questions people asked when reading chunks of text. In this case, it happens to be Latin. Uh, and looking for patterns, he discovered that af after people had asked three or four questions uh, about words and you know, weren't sure about vocabulary, you could predict two thirds of all the other questions they were going to ask. Uh, and he did this by breaking up you know, previous logs into different chunks and com comparing them against each other and doing all the good things you would do to have val you know, valid uh, results. So you're able to predict the kinds of things that might be of interest to people. And this is obviously a very powerful idea because then you're able to use a little bit of action uh, to get a sense of what people are going to need. And you can think about this, I think about this as a way to identify when people are flailing, what kind of questions are you asking? Well, maybe you should go back and learn the subjunctive, which you never did before. Uh, or maybe you should look at this or that. Uh, this is, so this is kind of a, a, a proof of concept to us uh, and illustrates the sort of thing that you could do to enhance uh, people's ability to understand, to see patterns in their own reading, their own questions, which they might not themselves have seen. OK, so that's kind of, this is kind of where we would like to go. So this is what an ideal future or present looks like. And this is what we work on right now with the modest collections that we are able to curate by hand. So I remember when I first heard about the Google Books project, I, I, we built a couple of thousand, a few thousand books over 20 years. And they all have wonderful markup. And people going over every page. And we've done all this stuff. And, you know, I heard, well, 10 billion books are going to be digitized in mass. And I kind of sat there and said, oh, is this like my what? Is my life wasted? You know, what did I do with all this time? This is all going to be done at scale. Uh, but of course, what you realize when you start putting in large bodies of material is you can't, um, you can't look at everything. And there's values 
is a, the, a million book library is really qualitatively a different space. Uh, and that's really the question I turn to now, the next few minutes before I finish up. So what can you do with a million books? Well, you want to have scalable services, obviously. You want to have something that can just run uh, at, for as much material as you have and give you some kind of handle on it. This is an example that we thought was important years ago and built for various collections of a temporal spatial browser uh, to look at, at the, the dates and places in a given chunk of material. And this is quite a scalable technology, gets run on everything. Uh, it was built by a guy named David Smith, who's now getting a PhD uh, in, machine, well, in, in machine translation at Johns Hopkins. But essentially, this is a collection from the Library of Congress on the history of the Chesapeake Bay. There's lots of noise because American names are really ambiguous, but the actual center of the cluster accurately reflects the geographic focus of this co collection of texts. And you can see that they, the dates extracted uh, reflect the temporal focus. And the point of this is, of course, that you can do this arbitrarily for as much stuff as you want, uh, and the results are useful. Uh, and this has been sort of a, a, on the, our homepage for seven years now. Uh, and this is a slightly different collection from the Library of Congress. Uh, this is the kind of thing you want. I, I'm really glad you guys are working on it because uh, you can do the technical work and I can use it. Uh, but I think this is, this is you know, how would you go about generalizing that? Now, the, the trick with million book libraries is how do you build these personalized collections or services uh, and collections of the type that I was pointing to before. I, the the uh, Open Content Alliance has made available about 200,000 books already. That's about 10% of what seems to be 2 million books that we can find doing our best estimate of what's available in Google Book Search right now. Uh, and probably about, so it's 10% of the existing corpus and order of magnitude about 1%. Uh, of what would happen if you actually digitize all the books that's in all the libraries that you've got your hands on right now. So even with 1% of what the ultimate corpus might be, uh, it's too much. Uh, there's way more than we can manage. So we already can play with some issues of scale. Uh, and we just finished a workshop at Tufts University where we got a lot of the, a lot of the energetic people in the humanities who've done practical work, uh, whether in the humanities or their human, or their computer scientists with a commitment to the humanities to talk about this and the results will come out later this summer. So with million book libraries, a num it's important to bear in mind that um, a number of quantitative features or dimensions change at once. Your magnitude, you're getting collections that are order of magnitude 10 to the third or more bigger than we've ever had with curated collections of printed materials. Uh, you're getting much less structure in the past, we've expected a lot of markup. You'll get none. Uh, your content, there's no limits. It's whatever's in the library. Whatever's on the shelf gets sucked into the, into the maw of the machine. There's no manual checking of errors. So you have maybe 10 times as many errors, maybe less. But you have a different set of, different set of issues there. You have access you have to think about 24-7 anywhere on Earth, especially if you have an open uh, access model uh, as you do, since you signed, Google signed an agreement in its agreement with Michigan, the statement that books would be made available without charge to the end user or the agreement was void. Uh, there are languages. Most hand collections assume a handful of languages, usually one. Uh, but you've got, there are 500 languages in Harvard's Widener Library. How do you manage all of this? And there are going to be a lot more languages as this material expands. And your audience is global. Uh, and massive, and that's really exciting if you're in a small discipline like mine, because what I want, uh, as I, when I think of as a classicist, a person who studies Greco-Roman antiquity, is to figure out how to de deliver as all we know about Plato or about the Peloponnesian War to someone who might be sitting in China or India or Indonesia or Africa in 10 years in whatever language they happen to speak and to customize it so we know roughly what their background is, what they would need to know for background, and give it to them in the way that they can understand it. I mean, that I think is really exciting. Now, and of course, I want to do the same thing. And you know, if you were to ask me the great thing I'd like to, be able to do, I'd like to have a conversation with people who speak no English who might be uh, uh, Shiites or Sunnis in Iraq to understand what's really going on. Uh, and understand what I needed to know about their background insofar as I could 
Uh, certainly, it's not going to be the same as living there and knowing their language, uh, but it's going to be uh, better than nothing. So there are core technologies here. Uh, and here, I just I really like the DARPA Gale uh, uh, program, which is their current language technology program, which in at least initially broke everything down into three types of service. And I think this really simplifies the welter of language technologies that are out there. So you have to go from analog to text. I think for Gale, this is cell phone conversations or speech. But from Monarch's perspective, it's page images, an analog medium to some kind of textual medium. And that can be linguistic symbols on the page, but it's also page layout, i.e., what is a footnote, what is a header, what's a page number. So there's semantic information encoded in layout. Then there's multilingual technologies. Uh, that includes cross-language information retrieval, which classicists actually would use. I have to read four different languages. So if I could type in English and get German, French, Italian as well, uh, our community would use it immediately. Uh, it's a problem with cross-language information retrieval. No one uses it. Uh, translation support, which can be a machine translation, but could be also helping people who know some of the language get more out of their existing knowledge. So me with my pathetic Arabic, you know, as I get to the point where I can actually read some of Al Jazeera getting stuck in an idiom. And I want to know what, what that idiom is. I don't want a simple translation. I want to see how this phrase, idiom is used elsewhere to understand maybe it's insulting, maybe it's complimentary, maybe it's, it's, it's colloquial. Uh, and then there's text to data is the last core service, you know, named entity identification information extraction. Uh, and the real question I, I ask you, or I ask myself, is how you can optimize this for various domains. Now, I have built a complete named entity identification system for English that I can apply to other languages. It works really well. It's been evaluated. We publish it and so on. I don't want to build the system. You know, I built the system to understand how it works. What I want to do is build the knowledge bases that would drive someone else's system. And I think that the work of scholarship for the next generation will be figuring out how to build the knowledge bases that will drive general systems. So there might be someone who has an identity identification system, and we would figure out but ultimately what kind of gazetteer information, what kind of features you would want to be able to find Washington, North Carolina, as opposed to Washington, DC. And I actually think that will be uh, the grand task of humanists in the next generation. We're going, it's like the, the 21st century equivalent of what the Germans did in the 18th and 19th centuries when they built the foundation of, of uh, much of academic scholarship for the 20th century. So here's just an example of one page image that I'll look at uh, where this is a, a page image of a, an edition of the Greek orator and statesman Cicero, and these are letters that he wrote to his friends. And they were supposedly not for public consumption. They're actually really important because they're the first real set of documents that allow us to get a sense of how someone thinks. Uh, in their private lives. The, it's in the continuous tradition of European literature. Uh, unfortunately for Cicero, he spends a lot of time whining uh, and talking about how he's not been treated well enough and he's much better than he has been treated in the past. So it's not always played out well for him that we have his letters. But it's a real window into how people thought and politics and society of the first century BC in Rome. And so it's a really an important source and people have done a lot of it versions of them. And, but this simple page exhibits a number of problems for each of the three core services uh, that I've talked about. So first of all, you need language models for something besides English. And anybody who tries to pump things in Roman alphabets through OCR, uh, and the OCR thinks it's English, is going to have instances where the OCR mangles your language. So you may get every character right. Uh, my, one example is the Latin word tum, T-U-M, means then. It's a high frequency word. It always gets turned into turn uh, if the system thinks it's English, which is an error. So you have to fix it back. But there's a lot of places where you really need to have the right language models, even if you, do, even if you can read the character script. And then, of course, you'll have something like Greek. And that is, uh, if you just pump classical Greek into a modern Greek OCR system, as we did, we got 80% accuracy. 80% of the characters were right, 20% were wrong, because Classical Greek has a bunch of complicated accents that uh, in modern Greek has been wisely left out. Uh, and so that's noise for the OCR. How do you go about getting past that? And then how would you deal with something like Syriac, the language of the ancient Near East, uh, Palestine, Syro-Palestine, um, which is really important historically, 
or other sources that don't have modern equivalents, that aren't, that aren't the subject of business memos in an important economy. Yeah, Dan? For some of those, you talked about the Syrian example. Um, are there a lot of these cases where, in the end, the amount of content that exists is fairly small, as in 50,000 pages, 100,000 pages, where, as opposed to developing technology to automate OCR, it's actually cheaper? To type you it just in. transcribe it and you'll get everything? Answer is, of course, that yes. Well, no, you know, actually, I would think anything that has its own script probably defies that, precisely because if you have a living script at some point that's recorded, you may have so much material when you actually get at it that it doesn't, you can't double key at all. But there will be cases where you, know, you might as well just type it in. Uh, I think there are, but, it's, but you have to deal, if you're doing cultural heritage stuff, uh, you often find the case of, say, Arabic manuscripts or, uh, you know, yeah, Arabic is different. Uh, I think there is, and Sanskrit is huge, there are languages where you know, you can't, you know, you've got a problem. But yeah, there will be instances where the corpus is so small, uh, like linear A, the li one of these languages from Crete, uh, which nobody really understands. There's a finite number of these things. It's not worth doing an OCR when we don't know what it means in the first place. So then there's, and there's the issue of page layout. And this thing, there's actually logic here. This is a commentary on that. These notes, this is Pizonem, uh, in italics with a little square bracket, this is quoting something up there, and this is an annotation. Uh, and so essentially, this is an anchor, or, or this is a, or excuse me, a, a pointer to a span of text up there. So you need to be able to recognize, here's Pizonum, find the right Pizonum up there, and link this annotation to a span of text uh, in the letters. So that's something, you know, that's not rocket science, but you need to be able to understand this, this data structure implicit in the page layout, uh, which is common to many uh, canonical texts, many disciplines with canonical texts. Okay. Of course, one language to the other, you need to have specialized tools. You need plugin or the capacity to create a morphological analyzer for the language of your choice. Uh, I don't. I know you can do, I don't have any desire to work in part of speech tagging for English because other people do it better, but I built morphological analyzers for Latin and Greek 20 years ago because I didn't have any expectation that anybody was going to solve that problem for us anytime soon. Uh, so how would we be able to plug the results of that into a larger system? And you need morphological analysis for highly inflected languages to do good analysis, to do OCR. You need it for spell checking because you can't anticipate every inflected form when a verb can have 20 million permutations. Uh, you want syntax, of course. Uh, you want to be able to figure out that this word is the object of a verb and so on. You want to have little translation tools, which again are going to depend upon language-specific data. And you want things like cross-language information retrieval. Uh, and then you also, even in the text the data range, there are domain-specific phenomena. Everybody has people and places, or virtually everybody has people, they have places. Uh, as categories, organizations, those are fairly global. Uh, but even if you can, your names are structured the same, and they aren't in most cultures, uh, you need different language models to figure out which, whether Cicero is a person or a place, uh, Cicero, Illinois, and if it's Cicero, which Cicero. Uh, and then there are domain specific classes. For example, citations uh, in, in, in Shakespeare. Classics, any discipline working on canonical texts will have a citation scheme which is different from what Sightseer analyzes or Google Scholar analyzes. And it's often highly ambiguous. TH period 115 could be Theocritus, Idol 115, or Thucydides, Book 1, Chapter 15, in a classics document. You have to have context awareness to disambiguate. Uh, and sometimes you have citation schemes which are common to a discipline, sometimes they're specific to a document. I, those are both things that showed up on that page. I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of managing the citational data that links information uh, in data. It's like chemical compounds or mathematical equations. It's at that level of fundamental need. And you're not going to do, you know, no one group is going to do this. What you want is the ability to train a large system at a deep level from the beginning, from the start. Uh, to, to extract this information. And then, of course, you want to be able to find compound statements. Certainly the simple ones 
that are meaning bearing that, you, that, are, that conform to some ontology that people actually agree with. So, you know, Calpurnius Piso, father-in-law of Caesar, that's a pretty good example of something you would turn into, a, into some RDF. So finally, what you want is what I'm thinking, what we're thinking about, what are the global analytical services that you want applied to everything? And here's a set of examples uh, that I think are, there's a pretty good consensus that everybody wants this for every document you ever put online. Some with more emphasis, some with others. Named entity identification, morphological analysis, syntactic analysis, source citation mining, quotation identification. Someone quotes Hamlet but doesn't give you a citation. You want to be able to recognize that and then say, the, you know, measure the popularity of Hamlet in the English speaking world up and down time, for example, automatically. Addition, alignment, and collation. I can't emphasize this enough for, for disciplines that, that care about particular texts. You may have 50 versions of Shakespeare. You want to find all of them, line them up, and see where they're different. And use them all to correct each other and figure out when a difference is a, is a conscious variant and when the difference is an error. You can do that pretty well uh, without too much work. We've already done experiments on it. And we have uh, a person from Norbert Fuhrer's group coming over from Germany to help us with it. Spend a couple of months focusing on that. And then markup projection, uh, where you might have one, this goes back to the question of what do you do with a curated collection of giant library? If you have one well marked up edition or document, you might use that to catalog 50 other versions of, the, of Hamlet. And so you have, how do you integrate domain specific resources? And there's a whole bunch of things that, you, that we might create that you want to put into a larger system. And then, you know, how do you use these structure collections as programs? This is an instance of what I just mentioned. It's a chunk from Antony and Cleopatra. And here you have your text with a bunch of complicated markup. Essentially, what you want to be able to do is take one heavily marked up text like this and then use this to align against all the other editions you may have. And then you can say, well, you find an original spelling, there are all sorts of variants, but you can nevertheless figure out slightly varying versions of this and say that all these other, here's all the other places that correspond to line 789 of Antony and Cleopatra in the first folio. So given one marked up text, use that to classify and catalog everything else. That's, that is a fundamental technology uh, that's easily implemented. That is a um, result that spins out of having a small amount of curated text. So you might have many different objects, knowledge intensive structures like this that you would integrate in to structure a much larger body of material. So the big question, how do domains provide services upstream into these very general services? So how do we get input? It's not enough to have an API at the end. If you, you know, I may have an API to Google book search, but if you can't get any of the Greek OCR'd, you know, what's the point? There's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and how do you add things like language tools and so on? And how do you make progress I mean, our, my feeling is you pick a topic uh, and do it well and solve all the problems. Maybe pick several topics. Our problems that I'm describing here in the humanities are actually very similar to those that my colleagues in chemistry are solving. Except they have chemical compounds and I've got you know, Greek syntax. But the architecture of the system uh, is strikingly similar. And so if you really do a few, pick a few domains and do them very well, and think about them and make sure that the architecture is aligned and you figure out what's domain specific and what the common foundation is, then you have a really powerful architecture. And that's sort of what we're working on right now. And my, I've worked in 19th century English, uh, Shakespeare and the Renaissance. Right now I've gone back to my home base of classical studies for a variety of reasons to my surprise. Uh, in part it's hard. You have to have a bunch of languages. You have to have all the European languages as well as Greek and Latin. Uh, there's a large public domain knowledge base. You'd be amazed at how much you've got in Google right now uh, that you have at your disposal and that I can digitize in the Open Content Alliance. And there are, you have art and archaeological resources as well as text. You have places. Uh, and there's a critical mass of tenured digital classicists, more so than any other discipline. So with that, thank you very much. And we might have room for one or two questions. So I think I've gone over it.